Great to see you back after lunch. Now, I've got some really cool stuff to show you here, including a bunch of videos that I hope will keep you guys um, awake and keen after the lunch break. Now, um, the first thing, though, is I thought I'd just pick up where I left off. Thank you. Um, we were talking about a whole bunch of sensors. Now, one really fundamental question with a sensor is, how well does it work? What is the lowest concentration, say, of a chemical or a biomolecule you could detect? How low can you go? Could you detect a single particle or a single virus or a single chemical molecule? Now, I'm going to show you a really cool video quite soon where people have done exactly that. But first, I want to kind of take you through something that led us through a cycle of, I guess, serendipitous discovery we didn't expect, again, to share with you not just the science, but the joy and the process of science, which is what it's all about. So I'm going to take you through a very practical example, and those of you who quizzed me over lunch asked me a bunch of questions about these optical rails and how they work, and I'd like to just clear one thing up that a bunch of you asked me. And the question was... You know, as you make these rails smaller and smaller, do they always still guide light? And no, in fact, if you go too small, they become essentially scatterers and don't guide light. But you have a wide range of parameters where you can guide the light still outside the fibre. So look, what is the limit of detection? So what we started to do in our labs was taking a model system, in this case it was quantum dots, and I'm going to come back to quantum dots in a moment. Can I just ask, who, who of you has heard of a quantum dot? Okay, fair number. I'll explain what they are in a minute. It's essentially an engineered nanoparticle. And we made up a solution of water, including these quantum dots, and diluted it, and diluted it a bit like homeopathy, and tried to see if the sensor would still work. And you get down to about being able to detect them at about 10 picomolar concentrations. And you can't go below that. Why? Well, does anyone have a, anyone want to hazard a guess as to why we couldn't detect lower concentrations than 10 picomolar? So the clue I'll give you is we're using a green laser. We're shining that green laser light into the nanorail. We're using that to excite the fluorescence of the quantum dot. We're then collecting back that information along the fibre and we're trying to see how low can we go. Anyone have a... Go for it. Look, good guess but not, not true. The dots are tiny. You're absolutely right. The quantum dots are tens of nanometers but they are amazing at converting the photons into different colour photons. No, but good try. You're halfway there. You're halfway there. Anyone else want to have a go to get all the way there? Going, going, gone. Okay. What it is is the glass itself emits a signal. The glass is never perfect. The glass itself has trace impurities, even at parts per million, that also give off a signature. And that signature at low concentrations competes with the thing you're trying to measure. And in fact, you can look at a whole bunch of different glasses and hit them with the laser wavelength that you're hitting the sensor with and see their emission signature, their fluorescent signature. So that's a challenge. And so it's essentially the glass itself that's the limit. So what can we do to get around that? And this is often what really helps in, in science is, you know, you figure out what's limiting you, you try and work it out, and then you figure out a clever way around it. And the way around it is introducing nanoparticles. So I'm going to take a detour to show you what really cool things you can do with nanoparticles and then bring that together with some of the sensors we're working on. So I'll introduce nanoparticles. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of them. And I'll put up a picture there of somebody putting on some sunscreen. Have you all seen the controversy about nanoparticles and sunscreen? Yeah, okay. So nanoparticles take many different forms. I'm going to concentrate here on ones that have interesting light-related properties, ones that can emit tailored wavelengths of light, okay? And probably the most famous kind is the top left there, which is the quantum dot. So the image you can see, I have a pointer, don't I? The image you can see here is the um, idea of what a quantum dot looks like. It's a very small structure. You can see a 20 nanometer scale bar there. And essentially it's designed to have a core and a shell and a polymer coating that means that if excited with a certain color of light, 
it emits a longer wavelength, lower energy, and the precise wavelength it emits depends on the geometry that you manufacture of that quantum dot. And thus you can create all these beautiful colours and it is used extensively in biological microscopy type applications, these quantum dots, because they're bright sources of light that can be tailored to meet whatever wavelength you want. And here's a graph that shows for quantum dots excited down towards the UV end of the spectrum, 365 nanometers, you can just tune the colour they emit by changing their size. Okay, so this is another example of a nanoparticle and this is one of these nanodiamonds that I was telling you about. They're rather beautiful. The shape of them reflects the bond structure within them. And there it is. Obviously the sunscreen, but I show you an, another example here because... These quantum dots here, sorry, not quantum dots, nanoparticles are specifically engineered nanoparticles for delivering drugs to particular cells in the body. So nanoparticles can take many different types and forms, but generally most of them take in, the ones that are optically active, take in light of a certain wavelength, absorb it, and turn some of that energy into emitted light, as in the quantum dot. And if that wavelength of light it converts it into is at a longer wavelength, then obviously some of the other energy goes somewhere else. Now, I'm going to introduce you to another kind of nanoparticle, and it's called an up-conversion nanoparticle, and I'm going to show you a little video. It's quite a short video, so I might play it twice if you think it would be helpful. But the concept I want to introduce you to is that at what an up-converter does is it takes lower energy light and turns it into higher energy light by taking in more than one photon at the lower energy and turning it into the higher energy photon. So watch that in this video. I thought that was pretty cool to do. So that video showed us how that engineered nanoparticle could take the photon of red and transfer energy between the particular atoms inside the nanoparticle in such a way that one of those atoms could then release the green light, up-converting the energy. Did, could you all see that? Yeah, okay. Any questions about... Yeah, please. It's a very good question. I'm going to show you in about two slides time the energy levels. It's all got to do with the energy levels. Basically, you give me a chance to say something here. There's a field of research where people develop these up-converting nanoparticles and try and develop the science of what atoms you put in, what concentrations and in what arrangements in order to give certain light emission characteristics. And what it's all about is about understanding each of those atoms, the energy levels that can exist in them and what energy transfer processes can happen between those different atoms. And I think that video captured it beautifully. Um, what I'll show you in a minute was how us trying to solve a very practical problem we faced in a lab created a new tool that could make better up-converters. Okay, so hang on, and if my question's still not clear, if your question's still not clear, ask me again. Yes? Yeah, 
It's got to do with where the energy levels sit and essentially it's an energy transfer or an energy coupling mechanism that happens inside the particle which has got to do with essentially where the atoms sit and what the barrier to that energy coupling trans process is. And so this was a, a, a beautiful illustration but it didn't show you essentially the maths and the physics that underpin which coupling or which transfer happens and which ones don't. Do you understand? So it's all essentially one great big energy balance that happens and it's got to do with which ions you've got in there, how close they are to each other and what states they're allowed to have. Okay? Good. And there was another? No? Keep going for the moment? Okay, so now you've got that basic concept of how you can take a couple of photons of lower energy light and transfer them around between different energy states within the nanoparticle to give off a photon of higher energy light or lower wavelength. Let's go back for a second to the fibre. In these fibres, I told you that their sensing performance was limited by the background response of the glass. So the really obvious thing to try is to send in a wavelength of light into the glass where the glass doesn't respond. And in this case, you want to send in near-infrared light. And we were using, in this case, 980 nanometers light in the near-infrared. You can't see it. It's just up in the near-infrared. And at that wavelength, we know from experiments that our glass doesn't give us a background signature. Now, if we take our fibre and we load these nanoparticles into the fibre and we send 980 nanometer light into the fibre, we excite the upconverters and they give off green light. And that then can be used to make the measurement without you having to send the green light all the way along the fibre where it excites the background response of the glass. So you see... Bringing these two fields together, these nanoparticles and the fibres, my initial intent was to get around this problem of the background response of the glass. And you can see in this initial work, um, we got down significantly in the concentrations we could detect using the nanoparticles themselves as the emitters of the photons we need to use for the sensing measurement. Okay, but that's not the only reason I tell you this because that's a, it's a nice story, but it's not the end of the story. And I now show some of these energy transfer diagrams which tell you what energy states are allowed in the converters we're working with. What we realised as soon as we stuffed these nanoparticles into our fibres is that simply by turning up and down the power of the laser being coupled into our fibre, we could change the intensity of the light that was hitting the nanoparticle by something like five orders of magnitude. And by doing that, we could just sit there and measure the emission coming off this nanoparticle. In the particular case we were looking at, it gave off both red and green light when pumped with near-infrared light. But if you look at different intensities, it gives off different amounts of red and different amounts of green. At different intensities, different energy transfers happen between these different levels. Now, previously, the, the guys developing these upconverters couldn't probe that, didn't have a tool to be able to measure the conditions where you get better red emission or the conditions where you get better green emission. So I thought we were using the nanoparticles to improve the sensing characteristics of the fibre. In reality, the, the highest impact of this work has been to give the people who develop nanoparticles a way of designing better nanoparticles, which is kind of cool. But wait, there's more. Because that then led to one of the things I think is probably the most conceptually profound that's come out of the team in the last year, which is being able to measure things from a distance. So before I should explain the slide, usually when we measure something, particularly something small, the smaller it is, as soon as you start to head in the micro and nanoscale, the closer you have to be to measure it. Okay? You tend to have to be inside a really good microscope. Now imagine the following. Say you've got your optical fibre. You come in with a photon of near-infrared light at this end. It travels down the fibre. Towards the other end of the fibre, which might be a metre away, might be ten metres away, it excites an upconverting nanoparticle. That then gives off a signal, which is collected by the fibre and measured back at the original end of the fibre. We were able to show using these upconverters that we could measure single nanoparticles moving into the other end of the fibre from a distance. 
And you can see that from these statistics here. These very sharp changes in these statistics show when you're observing none, one or two particles moving into the other end of the fibre. So that means now that you could make measurements of single ions, of single biomolecules from a distance without having to be inside a microscope, which I think is really cool. I'm now going to move on and show you something a little bit about smart surfaces. I'll be quite quick on this, but I want to give you a flavour of the possibilities that there are here. So I'm going to take one of my favourite optical fibre structures because I've shown it to you a lot already. And I've just drawn very crudely a little cartoon of some of the things you might want to do. One of the best questions I got asked over lunch, and it happened at least half a dozen times, so I imagine there's many more of you that have this question. It's all very well to in interact light with a material, but how do you get a specific information about what it is you're measuring? The way you do is by putting something very specific on its surface that responds only to the thing you want to measure. So probably the best example I could give you comes from biotechnology. Over the last 20 or so years, a whole bunch of what are called assays have been developed that mimic what our body does when we're exposed to something that our body wants to fight. So if we catch a bug, our body starts producing antibodies that are like a lock and key mechanism designed to hunt down that protein. Those lock and key mechanisms of antibodies and proteins are used within biosensors and diagnostic devices to see if you have a certain type of flu, for example. We can use that within our optical fibre to give us biological specificity. And we do that by putting these coatings onto the fibre. So we can coat the fibre with antibodies, for example. And essentially what you can think then is those internal surfaces of the fibre now become a scaffold on which you can add other function. I'm going to start with a really, really simple one because this answers the questions many of you are asking me about how do you detect aluminium in the corroding aircraft? Well, you need some chemistry that changes in response to an iron of aluminium. So in this particular case, and this is a fluorophore called lumagallium, if aluminium 3 plus ions come near this compound, it complexes them, threefold complexing here, and it increases the fluorescence of this molecule. Now, if you attach this, and I'll explain this a bit, but if you attach this molecule to the glass surface via some chemistry that anchors it there, any aluminium ions in the environment will cause an increased emission of light from that fibre. So you now have a specific sensor for aluminium. Now, again, just like my story on hydrogen peroxide going from fuel tanks to wine to babies, this is another example where you're going from corrosion to mental health. Aluminium ions are one example, and I'll come to this more later, where... Um, Detecting ions in biological environments is very, very important in understanding conditions such as Alzheimer's and other, other conditions that where iron balance is key. But before we get there, I'm just going to introduce something quite related that hopefully will help illustrate the concept, and it's about detecting DNA. There's a lovely cartoon there of DNA. One way of detecting DNA that's been developed over about the last decade is called the molecular beacon. Has anyone heard of a molecular beacon? Oh, it's always nice to introduce people to a new concept. Okay. It's quite simple to explain. Have a look at this little cartoon. You have a strand of... Sorry that it's slightly cut off, but I think you can see it. You have a strand of DNA in a little loop. At one end, you have a fluorophore that wants to give off photons of a certain colour. And in its native form, it's positioned right next to something that's called a quencher that stops it emitting. So in this form, in the solution, in the bottle, you have this little loop of DNA which is not emitting light because that fluorophore is quenched by this quencher. Now, if you want to detect a specific strand of DNA... You have to design this so it complements, it's the complementary strand to the one you want to detect. So now if this little molecular beacon goes into some DNA soup within the body, within a cell, 
If the DNA binds to this loop, it stretches it out on binding and the quencher is removed from the vicinity of the fluorophore and it turns the light on and it fluoresces. Whereas if there is no strand of DNA to match the strand in the loop, it doesn't bind and you don't get the light turned on. And that's how a molecular beacon works. And if you want to detect a particular strand of DNA, whether it's a few base pairs or hundreds of base pairs, you can email companies that make molecular beacons and they'll send you tailored molecular beacons with your favourite fluorophore on the end. What we've done is com coat the surfaces of these suspended core fibres with these molecular beacons. And we do that by using essentially something called a polyelectrolyte chemistry for those who are interested. It's essentially negative then positive, then negatively charged layers that allow us to stick these species onto the glass. So we have the beacon attached to the glass and then when the complementary strand of DNA comes and longs and binds, you get a lovely signal. And if it's even mismatched by one base pair, you don't. Now, what's special about this marriage of the molecular beacon and the fibre is it means that because you're interacting with such tiny volumes of fluid in the fibre, we've been able to make this in subcellular volumes, make this measurement, whereas traditionally you'd need a couple of hundred microliters to make these molecular beacons work. Going on to a new concept, and I know this slide's busy, so I'll talk you through it, all the surfaces I've told you about so far are static in a way. So you put them on the surface, they allow you to make a measurement and then you're done. You have to throw it in the bin. Once you've made your measurement, you've made your measurement. That's really not what you'd want to do. In the end, you want a device that can make a continuous readout, multiple measurements, that you could leave in an interesting environment and see what happens over time. So what we've been doing is working on photo-switchable surfaces, surfaces that themselves change in response to light. And this shows you an example here of, um, a, a, well, I'll co probably easier to see from a future slide, but essentially where the surface itself changes in response to light. So just to introduce you to this, I apologise, I don't know why this is cut off here. Um, this is something called a fluoroionophore. This is like a little cage, which has been, the chemistry of that cage has been designed to trap a particular iron that you want to measure, whether that's calcium, zinc, lithium. You can design the chemistry like a basketball hoop to only fit that iron. And when that happens, it could either turn on or turn off a fluorescence in the rest of the molecule. We then attach that molecule to the surface of our glass. And I show this to you to show you how important it is to get the chemistry of that surface attachment right. But how do we know we've done it right? If your optical sensor doesn't work, it can be hard to figure out why. And so I show this image that one of my PhD students put together that really illustrates the challenge of understanding the surface. The typical surface you're trying to look at, if you look at the level of detail we need to understand to understand the surface characteristics, would be like being able to see the resolution of the site that was our building site for our building prior to construction on the scale of a map of the whole of Adelaide. This is a real challenge. And what are we interested in? We need to be able to know the composition of the surface, the light emission characteristics of the surface and the roughness of the surface. So you need to use tools like atomic force microscopy and mass spectrometry just to understand what it is you've done to your surface because it's very important to get it right. So once you've done that, I'll come back now to this concept of the photo-switchable surface. Really, we want a surface we can turn on and off with light. We'd like a surface where we could send one colour of light into it, we turn it on as a sensor, we send another colour of light, we clean up or regenerate the surface. And you can see an example here of a photo-switch. For one colour, it changes its form and becomes an iron trap. At the other colour, it changes its conformation and it releases the iron. So I'll give you an example that works in terms of being a sensor for metal ions. So this now represents the surface of our fibre and here is the surface attached photo switchable molecule. It's designed to have a, one of these little basketball hoops, this little ionophore that is matching a particular metal ion we want to sense. You put in light, it changes its conformation into a trap, it can trap the iron and give off a fluorescent signal. 
change the wavelength of the light and it releases the iron. And why we care about this, just to give you some context, all these conditions from diabetes to manic depression to Alzheimer's, all the, being able to detect metal ions is absolutely critical and the capacity to start doing this within the brain is really important. And just about two weeks ago, some of my PhD students started putting fibres into the brains of rats in controlled experiments, collaborating with neuroscientists. And we're starting to ask the question of where does the origin of sensation come from? How can we measure impulses within the brain in these cellular scale volumes? So it's very exciting. And I'll show you one example of a molecule developed to sense lithium. So you can see here just a representation of the shape of this molecule and what it looks like in the lab without lithium. And then the lithium ion comes along and complexes and you can see the change in colour, which gives you specificity. I'm going to skip this for speed. OK, so I'm moving now beyond surfaces. So if anyone's got a question on the surfaces, very happy to take it because I'm now going to move to resonance. Thank you. Okay. Um, the simplest thing that happens is the conformation of the molecule itself changes and that means then when the iron comes along it's able to bind in a different way with the molecule that wasn't available in its unswitched state. So essentially that concept that I was showing of something like a basketball hoop is actually not that far off what happens structurally to the molecule under switching. What happens is some of the bonds rearrange with the switching and that changes the geometric conformation of the molecule. But there are other things you can do and the possibilities are quite endless. You can change the wettability of a surface using light. You can actually have little water droplets walking up and down surfaces just because you've changed things like the local surface tension as a, as a result of exposure to light. So there's a lot of games you can play. I think we're just starting to, to do it. Okay, so moving on to something different, exploiting resonance. Most of you responded that you'd heard of resonance before when I, when I introduced the concept. But for those who aren't, I'll give you an introduction now that will show you why we care so much about resonant effects for enhancing the interaction of light and materials. I throw, show you three very different examples of resonance. This first, which I'll come back to, is an optical resonator, which is very much a nanoscale device. Light rattles around this tiny little very perfect resonator that's on the scale of microns. Does anyone know what this is? Can't hear you quiet. Perfect, St Paul's Cathedral. Why do you think I've shown it? Anyone know? Whispering wall. Who's heard of a whispering wall? Okay, so what a whispering wall is, is essentially an acoustic resonator that allows the, anyone who whispers into one part of the wall allows that sound wave to constructively interfere as it travels around the perimeter of that beautiful, perfect structure so that you can hear something you otherwise wouldn't or shouldn't have heard. This is the example of a whispering wall in the Barossa Valley in South Australia. It's exactly the same concept. You've got the, same, you've got the idea of having a beautiful, perfect shape that allows the constructive interference of whether it's light in this case or sound in this case. And what's essentially happening is you can think of it in terms of this is an illustration of the whispering wall where you can see the rays bouncing around the perfect shape meeting back in phase and thus constructively interfering. And in this particular case, this is an actual simulation of the St Paul's Cathedral Dome, which shows the resonances for 69 hertz and these beautiful bright and dark spots along the edges which show this constructive interference at play. Probably one of the best analogies that really help you understand resonance is making an analogy between a resonator, and in this case, I apologise for the jargon, WGM means whispering, whispering gallery mode, and, and I apologise, this has been cut off, a spring. Imagine a slinky, okay? And imagine that slinky, you start it vibrating and you look at the period of its oscillation. If you attach different weights to the bottom of that slinky, it changes the vibration frequency of that slinky. It's exactly that effect that I'm about to show you can be used to detect a single biomolecule binding to an optical resonator. In, in a spring mass system, you have some kind of oscillation that has a characteristic frequency width. 
And any kind of damping of that system gives you a broader line width of that oscillation. The equivalent in the optics is essentially you have these optical resonances that are very sharply peaked as a function of wavelength and any imperfections in the resonator broaden them out. Now if we want to be able to measure something because it changes the resonance, we want these resonances to be as sharp and peaked as possible. So the, the, the physical concept we use to describe how perfect a resonator is is something called its quality factor. The higher the better. And what a quality factor is, is essentially the stored energy that's rattling around this cavity, whether it's sound or light, divided by the energy that's dissipated in one round trip. So the bigger this number it is, it means that less energy gets dissipated by imperfections as the light or the sound rattles around it. And optical resonators can have quality factors of 10 to the 10 and more. They're enormous numbers meaning that these systems store a lot of energy. Now, if you think of something with a quality factor of 10 to the 10, that's taking a small number of photons and rattling them around over and over and over again through the same material and interacting with the same environment. So you can think of it as like a way of amplifying a signal, amplifying an interaction. So... To show pictorially what I showed before, if you take the analogy of a slinky and you put a weight on it, it shifts the frequency at which it resonates. Similarly, if you have an optical resonator and you change the density of the material around it, you shift the wavelength at which the resonance happens. So what kind of form can optical resonators take? Well, look at a bunch of examples here. These are all optical resonators. I showed you this one, which is in silicon. This is in diamond. This is a beautiful, perfect little ring etched out of a diamond, solid piece of diamond. This, and I'll show you more at the end about some of our work here, is a wonderful, perfect little glass nanosphere or microsphere, depending on its size. It's formed at the tip of an optical fibre. And if you model how light travels around this resonator, you get electromagnetic field diagrams like this, which show the the bright spots of high-intensity light in this perfect constructive interference. And there's another one, it's called a bottle resonator. So how does it work? Well, this is a simulation of light rattling around in a whispering gallery mode resonator for the obvious analogy with a whispering wall. That's why it's called that. Now, one of the challenges is often how do you get the light into it? Well, one way people do it is by putting one of these little microspheres right next to an optical fibre or a taper. You launch light into that optical fibre, which then excites the resonance in here and also reads it out. And if it shifts because the environment in which the sphere is in changes, then you measure a shift in the wavelength of the resonance. So what I'm going to do now is show you a little video about how some researchers have taken this idea and used it to detect single viruses binding. It's a very short video, so I may play it twice if you need it to help you see how the concept works. We report biosensing using whispering gallery modes of a single virus particle reported within the last month in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Here you see the setup that's used. Laser interrogates a resonator, finds its resonant frequency. Now allow a virus to bind. When the virus binds, the resonant frequency shifts. It's from the shift in that frequency that the virus is known to have bound and also from which we can determine other things about the virus. Okay, let's do it for real. Influenza A virus, a scourge to the earth and people. Here you see the kind of shift that's measured. From this we get the size of the virus and its mass. Thank you for listening. A very serious voice, but the pictures were fantastic. And, and essentially, as that virus came down and bound on the surface of that sphere, it changed the resonance and you could measure it. And the bigger the virus is, the easier it is to measure. So what the challenge is, is measuring really small things. Can anyone think from what I've said so far today, how would you, say you wanted to detect that particular flu virus, 
How would you be sure that the virus you want binds and not something else altogether? Can anyone think? Yeah, you coat the surface of the sphere. What do you think you coat it with? Anyone? No, the antibody to the virus. Coat the spear with the antibody to the virus and in doing that, you see the resonance shift to show you you've coated with the antibody. You then coat with the virus, you see the shift and if you're really paranoid and you're still not believing that you've coated with the virus, you can put something called a secondary antibody on which also binds to the virus and gives you another shift. But this is an example where you see the marriage between the bio and the biochem and the, the physics coming together. So now I'm going to share with you an extension to this, which has been done in my lab, um, which is really cool. It's the same concept, these whisper and gallery mode resonators. But what we have now is this little sphere is not just in a microscope or on the side of a fibre. It's at the tip of one of these very special suspended core fibres. So the light comes along the fibre, down the nanorail. It excites the resonances in the sphere. Anything that binds to the sphere changes the resonant wavelength and you collect that information down the fibre itself. Now what we found in doing this is that we can actually get much better performance of the sphere when it's stuck onto the fibre. So if you look at this graph, the high spiky curves, the red ones, are when a 15 micron microsphere is stuck to the fibre and the black ones are the performance of the sphere when it's floating in a solution. So we were stunned when we saw this. Why does it work so much better when it's stuck on a fibre? Okay? And there are a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is, is that the resonances that are allowed to happen in that sphere are changed by sticking it on a fibre. It can no longer, for symmetry reasons, have all the resonances that the perfect sphere could have. It's forced to resonate only in certain equatorial planes, which sharpens them up. But there's another reason which is really cool. And the other reason is because we have excited it with the intense light from the nanowire, not just with the focused light from a laser, we've been able to turn this sphere into a laser. It is a micron scale laser itself. And that's why you get these very high spikes. But the, the other thing that's really cool about this is that because now the sphere is at the tip of a fibre, you can put it in vivo, you can put it inside the human body, you can stick it in a catheter and stick it in a person. And that's something you could otherwise not do. So one more example I'm going to give you of a resonance technique. And the diagram looks complicated, but the concept isn't. The optical resonators I've shown you so far have been spherical. And it's easy to see how spheres can vibrate and can resonate. I'm going to talk to you how you can use this to look at resonance in a cylinder. So now imagine you've got a cylinder. It's not a complex microstructured fibre or anything, it's just a cylinder. <laughs> if you shine light on it from the side, you can excite whisper and gallery mode resonances that are rattling around the capillary wall itself. Why would you want to do this? Well, I'm going to take a backtrack. There's a technique called capillary electrophoresis. Has anyone heard of it? No, doesn't surprise me at all. It's a very standard lab technique in proteomics. Essentially what it is, is you can buy machines for capillary electrophoresis and what they do is they're a way of separating and sorting proteins. If you have a complicated real biological sample from blood, for example, and you want to know what proteins are in there, what you do is you do something, capillary electrophoresis, which separates proteins out according to their size and using electrophoretic techniques in terms of their charge. And once you've separated them out, you can use mass spectrometry to, and UV visible absorption spectroscopy to figure out what proteins are in the blood sample. What we've realised is that if we excite a whisper in gallery mode, from the side by sending a laser in here and we cause light to resonate around there, we can measure the proteins going through that capillary. So instead of having to wait till the proteins fall out the end of the capillary and go into a mass spectrometer, we can measure them from the side as they travel through the cylinder. And that's something that you can do either at a fixed point or you can translate it or do it at many different points. 
to show you some experimental results. This is not Photoshop. I show you this because it looks like Photoshop. What it is, is it's a capillary that has had its inside coated with a beautiful, perfect layer of polymer that, as you can see there, about 20 odd microns, sorry, 20 odd microns thick. It's dye, doped with a red dye, which is why it looks red. When we send laser light in from the outside, we cause whispering gallery modes to resonate within that polymer, which is a slightly higher refractive index than the capillary in which it's coated to. And these are the resonances. They're rather beautiful. And these are experimentally measured. So you can see it's a very perfect geometry. As you change the size of the proteins that travel through the capillary, these resonances shift just as they did in the spheres. And in this way, you can make measurements of proteins travelling through the sensor. Okay. I'm going to show you one more concept before I wrap up with a, with a video that brings it all together. And this is something completely different, but it's still about resonance. And I'm going to introduce the concept of label-free sensing. So when I've talked to you today about sensing things with fluorophores, a fluorophore is what we call a label. It's something that is, you have to know what you're looking for, yeah? If you want to use a fluorophore, you need to know exactly what it is you're trying to find and you make a fluorophore that responds to that thing you're looking for. What a label free sensor is, is something that makes a measurement without knowing what it is. And, and they usually work on the basis of measuring the size or the density or the mass of a molecule. One of the most famous label-free sensing techniques, and this is an example of a commercial product, is called surface plasmon resonance. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's, it's quite simple, and I'll talk you through it. If you have a thin film of metal, electrons in that metal can resonate, can vibrate. If you shine light, so in this case through a prism, onto that film, there'll be certain angles of the incident light which will allow the electrons in the metal to vibrate. And this is, these vibrations are called surface plasmons. So in this machine that you can buy, you can measure the binding of a molecule to that surface of that metal film through measuring the shift in the wavelength at which the metal film is resonant. So this is quite analogous to what I've just been teaching you about whispering gallery modes. And the way you tell it's happened is you, you shine in the light, you change its angle, you map out the angles, and you find that there's a certain range of angles for which you didn't get much light back because that light was used to excite the resonances in the metal. And by measuring the angle for which that happens, you know what it is, what mass it is that's bound to your surface. Okay, so in our labs, being optical fibre people, we try to do this with optical fibres. So we took a very ordinary optical fibre and we coated it with a rough film of silver and flowed liquids around these sort of silver-coated cuffs or regions here. And this is what we observed when we turned the lights off in the lab. As well as seeing those dips in transmission I showed you, we also saw that light was re-emitted from the plasmon. What we're seeing here is that the sensing region itself, or the place where the surface plasmons are created, if you have a rough nanoparticulate film here, if you have nanoscale roughness, you can get that surface plasmon to lead to light re-emission from the surface. So what you're looking at here, you are seeing the surface plasmons re-emit light. And the colour at which they glow tells you the mass of what is binding to that surface. So how can you use it? Well, this is an example where you bring it all together. You take your fibre, put the rough silver coating on it, put these charged layers on that just allow us to stick biology to it, and then attach our antibodies. And in this case, we're interested in looking at influenza. We have to then, what's called, block the surface so that we only get the specific interaction between the antibodies and the protein we're interested in. The virus comes along now and binds to the antibody and if you want to confirm it really was that virus, you chuck in a secondary antibody. Every time you do one of these processes, the colour of light re-emitted by the sensor changes and you can measure it. So to show you this working in action, 
Um, I might skip to this one here, which is uh, recent results we got showing we could use this probe to detect early stage gastric cancer. So working with colleagues in the Adelaide Uni proteomics department, they had discovered a bunch of biomolecules that could either be increased or decreased in concentration in people with very early stage gastric cancer that otherwise could not be diagnosed. What we did is we took the antibodies to those markers and put them within different channels in our sensor and showed that we could detect them in biologically relevant concentrations. And what this shows is that there is a pathway then to a device that you could go to a doctor's surgery and spit on a stick and much like, you know, sort of a, a pregnancy test type result, you could get a marker saying, look, you know, you're good or you might have some cause for concern um, catch it, and then you can potentially catch the cancer much earlier than you would be able to traditionally because with gastric cancer, once symptoms set in, it's, it's a poorer prognosis than if you catch it early. So I haven't been able to go through and tell you all of the kinds of projects you can do by bringing these concepts together. And so what I've done is I've listed all current projects going on. I'll just give you one other example just because I think it's interesting. So we started a project about two months ago on detecting the margins of a breast cancer. So you may not know this, but if, if a, somebody has to have a, a, cancer, a tumour removed from the breast, there's something like a 25% chance that the tissue extracted was not clear at the margins, meaning that they did not catch all of the cancer. And they cannot tell in real time. They take the sample they've extracted, take it away for histology and pathology, and then get some indication of whether the margin was clear. So we're working with breast cancer researchers and clinicians to try and develop a probe that we hope ultimately will be able to tell in the actual cavity of where you take the tissue from, is this margin clear? And early results are very promising. So I think... There are many ways in which these sensors are going to be able to impact our capacity to operate. That sensor I showed you based on surface plasmon, we're working right now on putting them in oysters. I know that might sound really strange, but um, the seafood industry has severe problems with norovirus in oysters. And having a sensor, particularly in confined environments like cruise ships and the like, where you could confirm that your oysters are safe to eat would be very helpful. But that's more at the applications end. At the pure science end, I'm personally really fascinated by these new tools and how they'll let us ask questions that we previously couldn't ask. And I'll give another medical example of this rather gruesome picture of an artery. If you're suffering symptoms of what could be impending heart attack and you go off to have diagnosis or assessment done, one of the things I'll measure is thickening of your arteries. Did you know that there's no correlatory link between the thickness of your artery and the probability that that thickened artery wall will break off to form a blood clot. If there's more than something like 40% thickening and you have symptoms, they assume that's the problem and intervene with stents and the like. So what we're starting to do now is to work with cardiologists to try and measure the biochemistry of a, blood, of a thickened artery wall, of a plaque, so we can start to understand which plaques become blood clots and which don't, which are vulnerable to doing that, which aren't. Because it appears from all the evidence gathered to date that many of us can have thickening in our artery walls, which doesn't necessarily put us at increased risk of stroke and blood clot. So any questions up to this point? Yes? you asking the practical question of how do you get the sensor in there? In the majority of things we're doing at the moment, in order to try and have some progress within a reasonable time frame, you partner with people who are expert at getting in there for other purposes. So in the, in the case of the heart, we're working with a company that makes stents because they are the experts at getting into those difficult places. And then you figure out how could you put a sensor inside to the stent delivery unit. So that's the way you start. Yeah. In, in that kind of work, I see that as a, a tool for us understanding these systems better. I'm not saying all of us will go around dripping with optical fibres, 
but I do think we'll end up understanding much better how the regulatory systems work, how our bodies work, and thus what better treatment approaches might be. Sorry, there was another one. Okay, so what, yes? Uh, can you explain what that? Yeah, okay. Um, Look, there are so many forms of cancer, you know, some of which are more common than others. Gastric cancer um, is essentially a cancer of the, the, the colonic system and often by the time you see it in terms of blood in the stool and the like, it is quite advanced. In some populations, particularly Japan, the Japanese population has extremely high incidence and they do provide national testing for their citizens. In, for, often, sadly, these things come down to economics. In Australia and in the US and in the UK, it's a severe problem, but not severe enough that the economics warrant testing of everybody in the way we have pap smears in Australia. So, look, essentially, these things are a bit of a, a, bit of a black art in the sense that in order to get some handle on the biology in order to make a sensor, you need to have large databases of clinical samples of what normal is and what cancer is and uh, catching early stage cancer is very hard. Um, but that's what we're trying to work on because the earlier you catch it, the better. Okay, so look, happy to take more questions after, but what I'm going to do now is launch into a quick video about our institute and what it does. This is the picture of the building that I've um, mentioned to you many, many of you over lunch. It was launched last Friday and its facade is a brag grating. Oh, that's someone else? Good, it wasn't me. Um, and each floor of this building has a faceted glass facade and I'll tell you a really, really funny little story before I show the video. Um, we sat around with the architects after we'd won the mil money to build this building and we, they asked us lots of questions about the science we do, the science of light. And we told them some of the stories I've shared with you today about how patterning materials allows us to reflect and control light in special ways. And they came up with this design of this beautiful faceted facade. And when I looked at the, artist, the architect's sketch, I frowned and I said to them, it's beautiful, but I'm really perturbed by the fact that it gets bluer as it gets towards the ground rather than bluer as it gets towards the sky. And they looked at me and said, you're crazy, it's the same colour glass throughout. What I was talking about was the physicist's bluer in that the period of the oscillation or the periodicity of the structure got smaller as it went towards the ground. Yeah, so that's bluer, you know, reflecting shorter wavelengths of light. So I said, look, you know, it might not bother the architects, but I'm sure every physicist walking up to this building would like it conceptually to get bluer as it gets towards the sky. So they pandered to me and, and flipped it the other way up. And that's what we have. We have faceting that's bluer as it gets towards the sky. Um, and I, I can just tell you my enormous relief about three or four weeks ago when we won the Architects Award for... Um, or the architect won the Architects Award for the best public building in South Australia in the year because I was sure that I'd screwed up their grand... their <laughs> architectural vision. But this is the building. We're one of five research institutes at the Uni of Adelaide and we have 185 physicists, chemists and biologists come together um, and we do our research within six themes, ranging from developing new lasers, new materials, new devices for chemical and radiation sensing, biological and medical diagnostics, and right up into work on high energy astrophysics and atmospheric sensing. And in order to, in, in doing this, we think we can combine work on really fundamental ideas and very applied research so that we can develop disruptive technologies. So what I've got here is a 10 minute video which is the end of my presentation that I think brings it all together, gives you a sense of what it's like to do research between these discipline areas and shows you some of the faces of the other people that I work with to give you a sense of what it's all about. So I'll play that to you. IPAS brings together physicists, chemists, material scientists and biologists. What we're about is creating new measurement technologies that will seed industries, solve problems and create new insight into these areas of science. We really believe that some of the richest opportunities lie not just within the individual disciplines but at the boundaries between them. And as a result, we've structured our research into six themes. 
These six research themes span from very fundamental curiosity-driven research to quite applied research. And we find that mixing these things together produces amazing outcomes. For example, quite often we'll take a very applied research problem and in picking it apart and trying to tackle it, we'll discover something very new and fundamental. Sometimes it goes in the more traditional way and fundamental research leads to applied research outcomes. So within IPAS, we focus both on that underpinning fundamental research excellence that allows new technologies to bud out of it. We also solve real practical problems and try and draw on that rich base of fundamental technology and capability. Our team Medical Diagnostics aims to develop new methods to detect biomarkers for diseases and we're working especially on biomarkers for the early detection of cancer and we have discovered some biomarkers which are isoform specific and there we need different methods to separate them but also new methods to detect them more sensitively and that means we have to develop new detectors which are able to do that. This theme, Medical Diagnostics and Biological Sensing, brings together current state-of-the-art proteomics technologies for making measurements of medically relevant proteins that clinicians and biologists can use. But more than that, it's about developing the next generation of such technologies. And by physicists, chemists and, and biologists working together, we can create these new ways of measuring that will underpin tomorrow's treatments and diagnostics. Cancer is a massive problem in the health system and you the earlier we can detect the cancer, the better are the chances for survival. If you detect it early, the chances are as high as 90%. If you detect it later, the chances are as low as under 20%. And, and that's my motivation to come to work, to develop those tests, to screen people for the early diagnosis, that they can catch the disease early and they can be cured or their survival rate over the next five years is quite high. Our theme is about making the next generation of molecules and materials. And if you make these chemicals and smart materials, you can solve lots of fundamental and real world problems. Our work ranges right from synthesising new antibiotics to making photoswitchable uh, surfaces, right through to massive super sponge-like materials which have potential for absorbing large quantities of gases or for catalysis. We work closely with bio biologists and physicists to create smart materials the properties of which we can control and they can respond to their environment. There's one really interesting example. We've got a compound that will bind to aluminium and it will fluoresce in the presence of aluminium. And when we attach this to a fibre, we can detect the aluminium within localised environments. And that lets us to detect real life situations, for example, the corrosion with an aircraft. And in the process, we collaborate closely with other themes within IPES. One of my big drivers is, is the challenge of making new materials that can have a, an impact on real world problems. Um, we're interested in separating uh, gases like CO2 from, from flue gas, which is produced by coal-fired power stations. If we can develop materials that can uh, effectively separate that gas and allow us then to perhaps store that or mm -hmm. convert that into something that's chemically useful. Yeah, we've got a, a really neat state-of-the-art uh, synthetic surface lab within the Braggs that brings together researchers from lots of different disciplines. And we're already seeing the, the benefits of that collaboration and close association within IPAS. The thing we're involved in is chemical and radiation sensing. And that involves sensing a wide range of molecules in the environment or radiation effects in the environment. The chemical sensing side is looking at small concentrations of low concentrations of molecules in the environment, which could be organic or inorganic, depending on the context and the project. The radiation sensing side is to look at radiation that's um, from ionising radiation sources that's been stored in minerals or materials, and we're using that either as means of monitoring recent events such as accidents such as Fukushima, or for long-term storage such as dating for over thousands of years. And one of the really interesting things to emerge from this theme is that we're developing new materials and new architectures for measuring radiation. And this is a new kind of dosimetry, new radiation sensing that's really emerged from the expertise and facilities in luminescence and our optical materials and optical sensing technologies. 
In addition to that, within this theme, we do a wide-ranging um, suite of work in chemical sensing. One amazing example of how this theme works is encapsulated in the story of just one of our wonderful PhD students. He started working with Defence to develop a dipstick for the quality of fuel on an aircraft. He was measuring H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. We learned that the wine industry wants to measure hydrogen peroxide, so we started working to develop smart bungs for wine barrels. And that then evolved into what now is a vibrant and large collaboration with the medical device company and embryologists to use these same probes to listen to developing embryos. The theme that we lead together is optical materials and what we're really about is creating new kind of materials that can control, guide, generate light in new ways. The other part of the theme is also to develop new technologies in making these glasses, processing these glasses, and also making new types of fibres, which then can be used as fibre lasers, so that really the fibre itself generates a new kind of light. Other examples of outcomes from this theme are new sensor platforms in which we can control the light at the nanoscale and interact with liquids or gases to allow us to make measurements that previously were not possible. There is this rewarding thing of discovering new materials, new glasses, and this is really where, where I draw the energy from to get over these times or so where maybe something doesn't work for a certain time, you have to figure out a solution to this problem. Our theme is about creating new light technologies and sources. These new light sources allow us to build innovative measurement tools that enable us to understand the world around us. We're developing a large palette of technologies to develop new coherent light sources for applications in defence, spectroscopy, remote sensing and medical diagnostics. The lasers we develop are based on slabs and fibres with some operated at several hundred degrees below zero for high power operation. Techniques such as nonlinear optics allow us to precisely control the frequency of the light as well as using light to control light. Lasers and clocks are found at the heart of every modern precision measurement. We tailor both the purity and the colour of the light to maximise the precision of the measurement. We do this by building in-house specialty lasers as well as improving commercial devices like the Nobel Prize winning frequency comb and it's these modifications that provide the light we need to make the best possible measurement. We have invented a new chip laser at Adelaide which uses a laser to write a laser into an IPAS developed glass. This results in a low cost, compact and versatile laser that covers the infrared and is readily manufacturable. These light sources are destined to be used to test the foundations of physics and also to end up at the heart of field deployable equipment for industrial applications. Things we can think about are, for example, uh, looking for pollution or testing the input gas into a, a, a gas processing plant, or alternatively, searching for gravitational waves from the furthest reaches of the universe. The theme that we're working on in remote sensing and IPAS is um, motivated by trying to understand uh, nature's extreme processes at the very far edge of our universe and also closer to home in the Earth's atmosphere. So we use uh, telescopes uh, to try and understand what kind of objects uh, might actually produce these particles. Learning about how the universe really works, you just can't help but be you know, swept up in it and think that's fantastic. And I got into gravity waves originally because I thought the experiment sounded impossible. So I got into it and then I thought, wow, this is amazing. And then I realised it was possible. And then you work on it and then you start realising all the cool things that can be done with it from an astrophysics point of view to really understand the universe. The more technologies we can develop and spin off as part of this process, the better. And we're developing a host of new optical technologies that push the limits to enable this to happen. It makes me feel like I'm making a contribution to society in some sense. You know, you're sort of learning things that no one's ever learnt before. The work of an institution like IPAS capitalises on the multidisciplinary approach, bringing together different areas of expertise in order to find new and novel ways of doing things. 
Here in IPAS, our aim is to not only nurture research excellence, but to seed new disruptive technologies that have the potential to be game changers in how we deal with global challenges. We will do this not only by investing in our six research themes, but by deliberately creating a new cohort of researchers who are not afraid to cross the discipline boundaries and to ask questions and learn new languages. And in this way, we believe that we can start to seed new industries that will solve some of these global challenges. Thank you. I, I hope that just gave you some sense of really what it's all about and, and what we're doing in Adelaide to almost make you feel like you're there and have had a chance to to taste it as well. I'm going to start to wrap up now and I'm just going to close with some, just some really general thoughts that I hope help you in navigating your own passion for science and joy. Uh, I love what I do and it's very good fun because you, in this field you get to come up with crazy new ideas. You can do new theory, new simulation, but then actually make something to test out those ideas and that gives you enormous freedom to be creative and I often think perhaps that when we first come across science at school we don't realise that doing research and pushing the edge of science is creative and I wanted to share that with you but it's also wonderful being able to work on things that are ultimately things that could be used and that helps you get out of bed and come to work. Um, so some closing thoughts. It is now starting to be possible to structure light on the nanoscale and I think I've shown you the plethora of applications you can get from making new kinds of optical fibres. But much more broadly, physics has the potential to transform very, very many areas and it needs people like you guys going into all of these different areas of science and being willing to work together in new ways to, to drive forward the next generation of advances. Um, before I wrap up, I'm just going to thank, as I must do, all my funding sources because you can't do research like this without many, many backers. But really the most important thing is the people. It's about working with great people. Science is a people business. It's about having people who just love, you know, trying things and being resilient enough to keep trying when things don't work uh, and share in that joy of discovery. So thank you very much for listening.